Good evening. It's, it's so great to see so many people here who knew that Arab drama and translation would be so popular. <laughs> My name is Rebecca Magor, and I'm the director of the plays you're about to see this evening. And I'm very proud to welcome you. So the two plays you're about to see were written by three young Egyptian playwrights within the last five years. And it's uh, been a time of great social unrest and political instability. For the, for the reading you're about to see, we've had uh, four days of rehearsal to explore these wonderful texts uh, with the playwrights in the room. And it's been a delight to hear the insights that they have into their own work and to find a way to bring these texts to an American stage. As a co-translator, I grapple with not only the language of uh, how to make these texts work in a theatrical language in the mouths of American actors, but also which actors do we cast in these roles? How do we make this come alive uh, again on a US stage? Uh, the plays run about, uh, the two plays run about an hour together. And after the performance, there'll be a 10 minute intermission and that intermission will be followed by a discussion with our playwrights, Hani Abdel Nasser and uh, Yasmin Imam. And we're also joined tonight by Professor Carol Martin from NYU, who's a professor of drama. Um, and uh, the discussion will be moderated by Hani Omar Khalil, who has uh, arrived from New York and is a writer and a contributor to the online arts and culture journal based in New York. Culture bot for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, so please stick around after the intermission. This workshop is supported by a grant from the Mellon Foundation, administered through Theater Communications Group. It's a program called the In the Lab Global Connections. I'd like to thank the Huntington Theater Company for hosting the workshop. It's been wonderful to work with them. This event tonight really reflects their dedication to developing new work, uh, new plays and new theatrical works. I'd like to thank Kate Snodgrass, the artistic director of the Boston Playwrights Theater for bringing this workshop to Boston, and to the Huntington's playwright in residence, Belinda Lopez, for taking this project under her wing at the Huntington. I'd particularly like to thank the playwrights for flying in from Cairo to Boston in the dead of winter. <laughs> the two plays from tonight, they say Dancing in the Sin in the Mirror. Uh, you can read them in uh, uh, my forthcoming anthology called Tahrir Tales uh, and Plays from the Egyptian Performance. Tahrir Tales and Plays from the Egyptian Revolution. And that's published by uh, Siegel Books and distributed in the US by the University of Chicago Press. Um, and the editor of the series that the anthology is part of is uh, Carol Martin, who will be joining us on the panel. Before I begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And also, in case of an emergency, there are several exits, uh, one behind you and two on the side. So please be aware of those. And without further ado, they say dancing is a sin and the mirror. Thank you. They Say Dancing is a Sin by Mohamed Abdel Muiz with Hani Abdel Nasser. Translated by Mohamed Al Bakri and Rebecca Magor. A dancer's dressing room in a nightclub. A chaise lounge and a table stand in the center of the room. Off to one side, there is a dressing table with mirrors framed by light bulbs, perfumes, creams, makeup remover, and a tray of cosmetic accessories clutter the surface of the table. On the other side of the room, there is a caravan screen next to a stand of wooden clothes hangers. The last segment of an elegant and serene musical number is heard before the dancer enters.
changed a bit. <coughs> this week, she asked me five or six times every day if she could leave early this evening. And I told her it's fine. Go. Then she comes back to ask me again today, terrified that it'll be, that I'll be angry for her at leaving early. What does she think is going to happen if she leaves early? Does she think the sky is going to fall? <laughs> I wish she could see things my way. Get a little bit feistier. Dismiss shy and bashful act doesn't do her a bit of good. Why are her eyes always cast down? And why does she speak in that tiny, quiet voice? Goddamn poverty. The prophet himself asked God's protection from it. Poverty humiliates the strongest of men. So it's not going to cast down from Azza's eyes. Go, and may God be with you. First time she came to me for a job, I was sold on her right away. Her husband was beaten to death during an investigation into a burglary on their block. They rounded up a bunch of men from the street, and he happened to be one of them. She was then forced to leave her apartment in Munir de Saida, so she took the kids to live in a tiny two-room back alley place, all the way out in Nahia. Somehow, the kids managed to finish vocational school. One even got a BA. But they're all unemployed, save a couple of odd jobs here and there. Of course, there are people who are much worse off, but we all have to deal with the thorn in our side. What convinced me to hire her was the way she told her story, with such patience and strength. None of this woe is me. I can't stand people who rub life's hardships in your face and bring everybody around them down. Umaza doesn't go around smiling, but she doesn't go around frowning either. You probably describe her as resigned, like a person waiting in a cardiologist's office. <laughs> she knows her condition's going to kill her eventually, but she goes to the doctor's office and she waits for hours who knows? Maybe the doctor will give her a new medication and she'll get better. Or she could give up and die without getting better. What choice does she have? Can anybody really cure a heart condition? Besides, Umaz's headscarf is always perfectly pressed. I was happy for her the day her daughter got married. but. Barely a week passed by before her husband revealed his true colors. Turns out, he's a real son of a bitch. He made his living off a pickle factory on the ground floor of an apartment building in the most congested area of Mbaba. He distributed pickles to all the shops in the area, to Bulak and Bashtil. Of course, you would never eat these pickles. You wouldn't even touch them with a stick. Ugh. They gave me a jar once as a gift. <laughs> the vegetables were stale, maybe even moldy. Too little vinegar and too much salt. He was cutting all kinds of corners. But I'm not one to blame him. The guy's a cheat. But people like that have to find some way of making a living, and it's better than pickpocketing. Like everybody else, of course, he had to bribe the authorities to keep his factory open, but he couldn't keep up with the payments and they shut him down. And he took his anger out on Umaza's daughter. I mean, he, he went out of his mind, honestly. It's like the whole universe has it out for that woman and her daughter. I was determined to find her son-in-law a job with one of these wealthy Arab foreigners who patronize my shows. The spineless bastard is on his way to the Gulf tomorrow. <laughs> I hope he does us proud and doesn't scream. 
grew it up. And Um Aza, this saint of a woman, asked to leave early today so she could see him before he leaves and pack him some snacks so he doesn't get stranded with nothing to eat before his, his first paycheck. Should I answer this guy or blow him off? <laughs> <laughs> I have no desire to talk to him. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, <coughs> Mr. Salami. <laughs> I know it's Salama, but I would have thought you'd like the sound of it coming from me. Salama. <laughs> Salami's nothing fancy, but it's not bad. I'd never do anything to hurt you. Yesterday was our first date. Right. I reacted that way because I wanted, I wanted you to know exactly who you're dealing with, you big flirt. Forgive you for what? What am I, your mother? Oh, really? I have a big, soft heart. Oh, you're a naughty boy. <laughs> if you truly want me to forgive you, get me one of those BMW X6s. <laughs> I love the curvy fenders and the sleek sides. Look, I'm not desperate. Do you see me walking around barefoot? I happen to enjoy it. Well, well, well don't do me any favors. Hey, Pat, you're the one asking for forgiveness. I've got enough money to develop all the slums of Egypt, but I wouldn't want to upset you by demolishing your daddy's house and depriving you of your childhood memories. Goodbye. <laughs> to hell with you and your kind. You're a waste of my time. This guy, he became a businessman a couple of years back, and now he thinks he's a big shot. A few million, and he thinks he's Superman. He's an ass. If it weren't for the revolution, they'd have ridden him out of town. Unbelievable. How does someone get into business with no backing? Or even connections to someone with backing? That's their little plan. Fatten him up, make, him nice, make a nice plump dumpling out of him, and eat him up. <laughs> Go ahead. Ask me all about it. I've been around, and I've seen a lot. From inside the game, not from the sidelines. The ones I've known, people of wealth and power. If I made every last one of them into a bead on a necklace, I swear that necklace would reach from my <coughs> neck to my ankles twice around. <laughs> These eyes have seen it all. <laughs> His father left him and his brothers, that aluminum factory that makes pots and pans and stuff for the kitchen. So this man and his brothers built up what their father left them. They worked hard, ran an honest business, treated their workers well, and never stinted on anything the factory needed. They expanded and developed a good reputation in the market and became a brand <coughs> They exported their products to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Algeria and even Spain. Of course, people wanted desperately to partner with them. And how does treachery get started? So, there was this one high-ranking official. No need to mention his exact rank, he's done enough damage. A member of the Supreme Council and he'd attend all these high society parties. I, myself, was invited too because they liked a little dancing after the food and drink. They'd invite me because I didn't make a big deal about the money and I wouldn't demand anything from them. It's not that they were cheap or couldn't afford it, but they couldn't really ask for donations on one hand and pay for a dancer on the other. But what if one of the guests just happens to be a dancer? Trust me, when I dance, I mesmerize, even in a formal gown. No need for a dance costume. And that's why they invited me to these parties. Problem was, 
Over the course of the evening, my presence alone would fill these men's heads with all kinds of dirty thoughts. Even though I tried a hundred times to get them to understand that I'm not some easy plaything. But on those evenings, it was the possibility, the mere possibility, that ruined all the fun and messed with their heads. I didn't make any money out of it, although I would have enjoyed smacking those guys upside the head. <laughs> They're such a bunch of vulgar brutes. I don't regret any of those evenings. They're always worthwhile. If I had an issue with some authority or a problem filing some form, the big leagues there would take care of it. Anyway, it was one of those evenings, and the Major General from the Supreme Council... Oops. I gave away his rank. <laughs> anyway, he was there. Of course, on those evenings, you could have the pick of your poison. Every kind, every label. The cigarettes laced with marijuana. And there were messy platters and French cheeses and skewers of kebab. His excellency ate and drank until he was ready to burst. And, as fate would have it, he sat right next to me. He could barely hold his head up. And he would keep leaning on my shoulder. I, it must have been the wine in my soft bare shoulders that got him talking. <coughs> He was prowling around Fatih Ghazal and eyeing his fortune. I had to listen to him go on and on about how Fatih Ghazal and his brothers must have made 400 million off their inheritance. And me? Where's my inheritance? I'll tell you. They're my inheritance. At the time, I thought it was just the alcohol talking. But not even a month later, Fatih Ghazal became the front page item in all the papers. It seems that the bastard framed him for tax evasion and currency speculation and coerced the biggest shareholders of Fatih's, of Fatih's company to sell out and prodded his suppliers into suing him for every late penny. Back then, there wasn't anyone who wasn't asking Fatih for money. He was a sinking ship. And this currency speculation issue and the loss of the shareholders' rights gave His Excellency leave to devalue Fatih Ghazal's holdings, put them under state control, and inherit them legally. So he took what he could for himself and his entourage and messed around with the holdings until the company was in ruins and forced to shut down with no potential for produ product, production or export. And what was once worth 400 million was now worth a third of that. And whatever was left was looted and the workers and employees were hung out to dry, and they locked Fatih up, and he had to give away any claims he had on anything. No one can stand up to these people or get back at them. They have all the power. They have the law on their side. They know how to clean up the paperwork and keep their names spotless while making their victims a son of a bitch. They're demons. These people need a doomsday to bring them down, not just a revolution. These are the guys, these are the sons Satan begat when he was older and wiser, and they keep telling me dancing is a sin. <laughs> All right. Who do I hurt? What harm do I do? No one's forced to come to the nightclub. <laughs> they watch me with pleasure. I don't bother anyone. I don't deprive anyone of a living or stand in the way of anyone's interests. And if I do something for myself or ask a favor, I make sure it's not at anyone else's expense. I try not to hurt anyone's feelings or refuse any requests for help, but I'm not a sucker. <laughs> if someone tries to pull a fast one on me, I wrap them around my little finger and fling them out of town. <laughs> and if someone's vicious with me, I step on them. Viciousness for vicious people, that's what I say. <laughs> a few years back, <coughs> I crossed paths with the kind of man who comes off as a real Prince Charming. <laughs> Tall, broad shoulders, a touch of Turkish blood in his veins. Sandy hair, a quiet smile, pleasant voice, clothes always perfectly tailored. <coughs> he had a 
good position in one of those uh, public sector companies that was privatized and sold to foreigners. He and the chairman of the board of directors and the general manager were the only Egyptians that kept managerial positions under the new owners, the foreigners. The chairman of the board of directors and the general manager were spared because their connections brought business to the company. And our friend, who was kept on as the financial and administrative manager because he was quiet and discreet, was also put in charge of human resources. <laughs> he was responsible for coercing people into taking an early retirement and eliminating company workers as staff members. And he was promoted. And he accepted bonuses for it. We got to know each other pretty well. We started going out together, and he'd drop by and see me at the club. Frankly, I was attracted to him. I liked his composure and his calmness and the way he carried himself. And a few times, that thing happened between us that can happen between a man and a woman When I was with him, I didn't feel that he was enjoying himself, or that he felt any ravenous <coughs> desire inside, or that he was even longing for tenderness. I felt like he was snatching something from the people around him and spitting on them. First time, I didn't trust my hunch. Second time, I felt sorry for myself. Third time, I told myself I'd be a slut if I ever did it again. Eventually. I realized that calmness in his face was arrogance. He'd be sitting with me at the table, speaking with the utmost politeness about whatever, while his eyes were sizing me up and saying, you're nothing but a cheap dancer. Turns out he's like the gravestones of sinners, a beautiful garden on top and fire and brimstone below. I held up for a few weeks. I didn't call him or return his calls. And then I dialed his cell and hung up. <laughs> he called back right away. I told him I wanted 10,000 pounds and to meet me before sunset on the street between the cemetery and the shrine of Saida Nafisa. I parked my car, and when he arrived, he parked in front of me. He got out and came up to my window and wanted to hand me the money. <laughs> he thought I wanted payment from him. I said to him, you couldn't wait for me to get out of the car and say hello? I got out, said hello, and took the money from his hand. And right in front of his eyes, I handed it out to a couple of beggars who I asked to wait for me in the alley off the main street. Money can teach a man a lesson, right? <laughs> he stared at me, rushed to his car, and drove off. He was afraid I'd expose him or make a scandal. Since then, we've gone our separate ways. And then, two years later, <laughs> I was dancing at a concert in the resort by the Red Sea, and I, I don't remember why, but I had finished early that night, and by midnight, found myself in my room alone. Back then, there was this drummer who had been working with me here and there, and I couldn't get him off my mind. He was energetic, clever, savvy, never petty. He was well-built and daring and had a really big heart. <laughs> and he was always so put together and smelled great, whether we were in rehearsal or performance. I felt maybe he had a thing for me too, but I thought it was better for me and better for him too that we didn't get together. Because no matter how far he goes in his career, you know, what's he going to become? King of the drummers? <laughs> Early the next morning, I grabbed my sunglasses and went to lie out on the beach, and who do I see? Mr. Chief Administrative and Financial Officer. And he's carrying a plate of beans, a plate of falafel, and a basket of bread. He digs a beach umbrella into the sand and then stands up to serve two ladies stretched out under umbrellas next to me. Turns out, they're the wives of the chairman of the board and the general manager. 
He puts the food down in front of them, and one of them says to him, What's this? How could you bring us all this spicy food and no pickles to go with it? Sure enough, he's got a bag of pickles in his pocket. And I thought to myself, You suck up. You brown noser, you bootlicker. Now I understand where your complex comes from. You're a houseboy. You're a poodle, a limp dick. Lives miserable. The poor people. Oh, merciful God, it's your will, not mine. And they say dancing is a sin. Play something happy. <laughs> those movies and TV series because I've earned them. Frankly, I'm just as good as those famous dancers, Samia Gamal and Naima Akef, and better than Tahaya Karioka. She's a very precise dancer, but somewhat mechanical. She doesn't have the soul of Naima or Samia, but Tahaya was a brilliant actress. She was at the top of her game, and there's never been anyone like her. There are a few actresses who know how to dance, but the others are just shaking their booties or their bones. <laughs> Getting late. They aren't here yet. They haven't even called. What, are they blowing me off? <clears throat> Hello? Yes, Marcel, where are you? Still home. I'm in my dressing room at the club. No, I don't need to go home. I brought my things with me and I'll leave from here. Isn't that what we agreed on? Go, remind your slug of a husband. He needs a kick in the pants to keep him moving. Seriously, are you about to leave? Should I change? Okay, okay. When you turn onto my street, give me a holler and I'll meet you in front of the club. Bye, sweetie, bye. Marcel, Marcel, we got to know each other at Mohammed Amish's hair salon. Of course, not just anyone gets an appointment with Amish. She recognized me and knew I was a dancer. Turns out, she and her husband were invited to the club and she saw my act. So we started talking and she was very sweet to me. And not too many people are like that with me. But I didn't respond to her right away. I kept my distance, but we exchanged numbers, and after that, she'd schedule her appointment at Omisha's at the same time as my appointment. So it was clear she wanted to strike up a friendship, but you know, we're not the same religion, and that's a big deal. This religion thing can be sensitive issue, you know? But after thinking it over, I said to myself, this woman has gone out of her way to be nice to me, and in the end, Whatever she does for her religion doesn't do me any harm, and whatever I do for my religion doesn't do her any harm. So 
It's ridiculous for us not to be friends. She doesn't have to take a pilgrimage to Mecca with me, and I don't need to eat the bread of the Holy Communion with her. <laughs> but what's to stop us from enjoying time and spending time together at a seaside resort? <laughs> anyway, we became friends. It started with our date at Omisha's Salon, and after that we'd meet at her place, and she'd come see me at the club, and we'd travel together. And now, here I am, waiting for her and her lazy husband so we can drive out to their ranch on the desert street between Cairo and Alexandria. Seventy breathtaking acres, like something that used to belong to the old aristocracy. And they keep horses and ostriches and all kinds of splendorous things. Marcel and her husband know how to live. Frankly, they taught me how to enjoy the good things in life. She's a clever woman, and she played a major role in building this fortune. She speaks English and French like she speaks Arabic with me. Her German is not as good, but she still manages. First time I went to her house, I met some foreign ladies, and she asked me to teach them how to dance. Basically, I just taught these ladies how to shake their behinds and have a good time. Towards the end, one of these foreign ladies took a gold bracelet with diamonds off of her wrist and handed it to me. At first, I refused with all my heart, but Marcel winked at me to take it. She said it's no big deal because I taught them something new. Quite frankly, Marcel is good at giving and taking. It turns out that these foreign women are not her friends. They're her partners at some NGOs, something for the rights of working women or children or battered youth, or I don't know what it was this week. <laughs> these organizations get their money from abroad. In truth, Marcel does serve the poor neighborhoods. Shofa and Masara, the Christian neighborhoods, of course, but also the Muslim neighborhoods of Yumbaba and Imam al-Shafai. She gives a little here and a little there. You know, she gives away a pound of meat and gets back a mortgage payment on their villa or on the chalet on the northern coast or tuition to the German university for her kids. One time she told me, it's mentioned in your Quran, charity is meant for the poor, the miserable, and those who work to collect it. I said, yeah, Marcel, those who work to collect it, not those who are guzzling it down. <laughs> but Marcel is a good friend. She's never suggested, not through comment or even a look or tone of voice, that dancing is a sin. She doesn't mind being seen with me. She spends time with me and goes out to eat with me. After all, it's the company that makes the feast. My sister. My own flesh and blood. I can count the time I've seen her on one hand in 30 years. After my mother and father passed away, my brother followed suit and died in a train accident. He was engaged and in the middle of redecorating his apartment. <coughs> My sister and I were left alone. We had only one another and whatever our father left us. I was the older one, the fairer one. And things looked brighter for me than my sister, Mervette. But the groom came a-calling for her because I had been seen hanging out with this drunk Hussein. At night, he'd smoke pot and drink and make up all kinds of stories about us, which were backed up by his fists and infamous humor and his temper. Nobody dared challenge him. So, that ruined my reputation. The man who proposed to my sister was a lawyer, a slick talker. He's the one who turned her against me, even though we loved each other like we were soulmates. He's the villain. He turned her against me, not in any explicit way. Everything was underhanded and subtle, just like a lawyer. First. She was pregnant and couldn't go anywhere. And then after Noah and Sema were born, it became, oh, the kids are too little. One day they're sick, another day it's too cold outside, we can't go up with them. And 
And then after that, they're in school. Or, sorry, they have lessons. Or, extracurriculars. And even holidays. He found some reason for keeping my sister away from me or for preventing her from visiting them. Even after the kids grew up and Noah got married and had a house and kids of her own, my sister was still in the habit of coming up with excuses. And the new excuse was, I'm taking care of Noah's son. <laughs> Fine, sister. Go, have a ball with Noah's son. Instead of her joy enjoying her grandson together, she's made me jealous of a kid you can hold in one hand. And it's all this man's sneaky plan to turn her against me, to keep two sisters apart because, God forbid, one sister chose to be a dancer. But he's not ashamed to accept cases from all kinds of cheats and thieves, and you name it. He convinces himself that a lawyer's responsibility is to deal with circumstances and procedures and that the judge ultimately decides. He concocts exit strategies for crooks and prevents my sister from seeing me because dancing is a sin. People can't see their own transgressions. But God is the ultimate judge. My sister's husband raised his kids to put their own interests first. When my niece, Noha, finished her bachelor's degree in science, <coughs> her father looked around until he found her a job at an American pharmaceutical company. Hmm. Connections are a sweet thing when there's a flow of favors back and forth. Well, <laughs> at this company, the Americans taught Noha an even greater love of self-interest than she had soaked up from her father. <laughs> All she sees are dollars and cents and numbers back and forth in front of her eyes. And she's become intimate with bank accounts and deposit slips and visa cards. <laughs> she works in drug distribution. One day, she called me out of the blue and came by the house for a visit. She's charming and feisty. You'd think I had raised her. <laughs> but I haven't seen her more than two or three times in her life. I didn't feel she had a problem with her aunt being a dancer. It's different for her mother. She has a different mindset. But the girl comes in, and she brings this expensive stuff from French makeup, lots of different things. So we sit in and dive in together and figure out how to apply it and remove it. And the girl's good at this stuff. She taught me well. My look improved, thanks to her. Before then, even the expensive stuff looked a little vulgar on me. Another time, she calls me up and says, how about 25,000 an hour for dancing at the Porto Sokna Resort? I say to her, for your sake, sunshine, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, her company was having a big conference and invited doctors and pharmacists and journalists. Turns out they were marketing a new drug God protect us from evil, for people who suffer from that horrific illness, from cancer. How much do you think for a packet of six pills? 12,000 pounds. That's 2,000 a pill. And these people are all networking in this grand hotel, sleeping on silk sheets and sitting on imported furniture and on and on, eating from an open buffet three times a day and lounging in the pool and passing the evenings with some light entertainment because their hearts are grieving for those afflicted by this illness. This illness that perplexes and tricks the mightiest and most able among us. My act was on the evening of the first day. Afterwards, Noah took me to her friend, the one footing the bill, and I grabbed my 25,000 in cash. And even though I was invited to stay for three days without working again, I couldn't bring myself to stay the night. I collected what they owed me, and I brought that 25,000 to people who'd been hit hardest by the disease. There was one woman, an acquaintance of my mother's, who was barely getting by out in Sabil Omaba. And the second woman was the dresser of one of my dancer friends. For the last six years, she's been battling the nasty disease and losing. And a third, a young man, 
stand-up comedian who had worked in the same club with me. The disease took his youth, his voice, and his jokes. May God cure them every one. The imams and scholars say that God is good and accepts only that which comes from good. When I give a sum like that away, I personally feel not just satisfied, not just happy, but as though I've done a good deed. But you know, the money comes from dancing, and dancing is a sin. Fine, I won't contradict them. They're the scholars. So that means I won't get a reward for giving back to my fellow human beings. No reward for faithfulness and sympathy for the sick. In any case, God and I will have our own reckoning. One time, I was flying back from Dubai, and I happened to sit next to this real proper Egyptian lady. She and her husband and kids had been living in the Emirates for 15 years, and she was dropping by to see her mother and going back to her husband. Of course, you know women. They'll talk to they drop. So she started talking with me. And you know, I love to chat. And I don't like to brush anyone off. Everything she said was prayer this and praise that and the prophet this, and what's allowed, and what's a sin. Turns out, she's really religious, and she reads all kinds of books about religion in the Quran. Not a month goes by without her reading it cover to cover three times. And she only watches religious programs, like Recite and The Message, and she knows the schedule for all of the sermons on the Dream Network, and on Access TV and NBC. I thought, I get it. She's well off, and everyone pampers her, and she's free to lead a religious life. But I bet if she and her husband had stayed in Egypt and were working for an hourly wage like, wage like the rest of her family, she'd spend her time working like a pack mule, going from her work to her housework to the kids' homework, and every mention of her husband's name would start with an insult and end with a curse. <laughs> that no good son of a bitch. That, and damn his lazy ass. And she'd only have time to watch cooking shows on television in hopes of discovering the secret of transforming eggplant to caviar. <laughs> because when, when a person lives in luxury and doesn't have to worry about making a living, she can lead any kind of life her life, any kind of life her heart desires. Among other things, this lady on the plane talked to me about the terms for repentance. First, you admit guilt. Next, you stop committing the sin. Third, you swear to God never to do it again. And fourth, if this sin affected other people or impinged on their rights, you ask forgiveness from the people you wronged to restore their rights. Her phone rings. Marcel's calling me. She must be turning down my street. Well, if dancing is a sin, my repentance would be easy. I only need to meet the first three conditions, and that's between me and God, and he's generous and loving. But what about the rest of these guys, whose crimes come at the expense of other people? Destroying homes, cutting off people's livelihood, crushing them and drowning them and burning them. Will they know how to rebuild the homes they've destroyed? or bring back those who've died, or save those who've turned to drugs? May God help them. Hi, Hassan. Hassan, where are you? Where have you been hiding? A bean sandwich. No, no, no. Oh, from the food truck across from the club. No, my friend, I would, but I'm getting picked up soon. Yes, 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 you're on your way. Good, good. 
I would have asked you to bring one for me, but I'm fine. Okay, listen, I'm leaving the room now. If you want to come and clean it. But Hassan, promise me you'll give this room some real attention, okay? Yes. I've left a basket of fruit for you. No, it's nothing, it's nothing. It will go bad, I told you. I'm going on vacation right now. Give it to the kids. Yes? Okay. Enjoy. Uh, and by the way, the work clothes I left hanging everywhere, don't take them down. Yeah, they stink. Let them air out. All right. Bye. Bye. Her cell phone rings. Coming, Marcel, I'm coming. Congratulations! <laughs> Smile more. <laughs> Congratulations! Congratulations isn't enough. Congratulations and God bless you! And to him, congratulations. You chose the perfect one. Smile more. What will people think? Congratulations and God bless you. Congratulations. You picked the perfect one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting all my life for this moment. I'm not finished dressing yet. I'll be out in a moment. Go use the mirror in the other room. What if I just 
went like this? <laughs> what if you just went out like this? Are you crazy? Have you forgotten everything you talked about? Have you forgotten everything we talked about? A good girl lowers her head, speaks with a low voice, and covers every part of her body. <laughs> you need to understand, dear sister, the veil is the only thing that can keep you safe and guard your virtue. If you went to the butcher store to buy a piece of meat, which piece of meat would you pick? Would you pick the piece of meat hanging outside with flies buzzing around it, or would you pick the piece of meat that is clean and covered in the refrigerator? <laughs> piece of meat. Piece of meat. Piece of chocolate. Chocolate. If I were to offer a man two pieces of chocolate, one with a wrapper, one without a wrapper, which would he pick? Exactly. He wouldn't even look at the one without a wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> a piece of chocolate. A good girl attracts the attention of a man and inspires him to propose. Quiet girl. A girl who follows orders. I want to be happy for you. I want to be happy for you. I want to be happy. My love, tell me what I can do. Like this color on me, burgundy. <laughs> Show me how you like it. Like it. <laughs> like it. She's my brother's niece. But my brother and his family are crazy. We know our place. My cousin Sarah. I don't want to hear you mention her name.
Sarah this and Sarah that. I don't want you to have anything to do with her, and I don't want you to mention her name. I know she's my niece, but my brother and his family are crazy. And I don't want you to have anything to do with them. Don't compare yourself. Sarah this and Sarah that. I don't want you to mention her name. I don't want you to have anything to do with her. They've got a lot of money, so they can behave any way they want. As for us, we know our place. And you need to dress modestly so you don't get harassed in the streets. We don't have a private car to lock you up away in. And your father doesn't want any trouble. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. When I get married, I want to find a girl just like you. A good girl. Quiet. That's as she's told. And I'm going to use every trick in the book. I'll try my best to get you hooked. Hey, baby. Every night, every day. I'm going to say, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Look out, boy, because I'm going to get you. I'm going to make you love me. Yes, I will. Oh, yeah.
straighten it. Get some colored contact lenses. If you've got a feeling that he likes curvier girls, then put on a little weight. I mean, actually, you could use to put on a little weight if you're a little skinny. Skinny girls are in, so stop eating so many sweets. him for silly reasons. <laughs> a good girl does as she's told, rejects people, accepts people, rejects people, accepts people, rejects people, accepts people, rejects people, accepts people. We, we don't want anything to do with them. We don't want anything to do with them. We don't want anything to do with them. A good girl does as she's told. A good girl does as she's told. A good girl... Does... What is she telling you? What are they telling her to do? Oh, 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 seriously? Uh, he's dating C. 
Sarah? He proposed to Sarah. And, sh and she's considering it? They're engaged. <laughs> Today. That's, that's, that's great. That's great. I'll be right out there. Congratulations, Sarah. You made the perfect choice. Congratulations and God bless you. What do you think about me? Am I a good girl? A kind of girl that doesn't get into trouble? Do I look good? Am I a good girl? Oh, by the way, Sarah. By the way, Sarah. It's time. You're grown up. You need to take responsibility. With whitening toothpaste, your smile will charm him. <laughs> Men don't go for conservative girls anymore. What will people say? A good girl does as she's told. A good girl does as she's told. A good girl, good girl does as she's told. A good girl does as she's told. I'm coming, just give me a second. A good girl does as she's told. A good girl does as she's told. Go use a mirror in the other room. A good girl does as she's told. A good girl does as she's told. Ah, congratulations, with a smile. Congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Mm, and a pinch for good luck. Congratulations. Sarah, Sarah, he chose Sarah. But why? I'll be there in a second. Congratulations. I'll be there in a second. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations.
Thank you everyone for braving the Nor'easter tonight to attend this meeting. Uh, we were all very, very excited about the turnout, and I have to say, uh, those of you who attended, this is still 90% more people than I, I anticipated. <laughs> 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 here, so, so, you know, no pressure or anything. But, uh, uh, and we're also very excited about tonight's panel, which I hope all of you will find engaging and illuminating. My name is Hanny Khalil, and I'm a contributing writer to CultureBot, which describes itself as an online publication devoted to critical thought about experimental performance. So here we are. <laughs> my area of focus in my CultureBot pieces has tended towards theatrical pieces that have emerged from Egypt in the wake of the 2011 revolution there. And this emphasis has allowed me to see both of these works several times now, both as readings and as full stages, stages. I'm absolutely delighted to have both the playwrights here tonight and to be able to join us for the Q&A. I will begin by introducing them along with the rest of our panelists. I would ask you all to please politely hold your applause until I tell you not to. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's begin with uh, Dr. Carol Martin. She is a professor of drama at Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. She's the guest editor of a recent special issue of TDR, devoted to urban environments as performance performed in the city. And for our purposes, more importantly, she is the general editor of In Performance, the book series devoted to global anthologies and plays and performance texts published by Siegel Books and distributed in the U.S. by the University of Chicago Press. Uh, her forthcoming anthology, Tafir Plays from the Egypt, Tafir Tales, Plays from the Egyptian Revolution contains both works that have been staged tonight. We have um, Yasmin Imam, the playwright from Mirror. Yasmin began writing short stories in college and turned to writing and directing for theater in 2010. Her first play, Joy Seeker, was selected for several independent festivals in Cairo in 2011. In 2012, her play, Angry Grain, was shortlisted in the Arab Theater Institute competition. In 2014, her play, The Mirror, was part of the To Be Continued Festival and the National Theater Festival in Egypt. Her play, One Shoe for Everyone, was published in 2014 and featured on Egyptian radio. <coughs> uh, joining us as well is Sarah Malwood, who will be providing translational assistance for us tonight. Hany Abdel Nasser is the playwright for Lisa Dancing as a and tonight's Buddha Kapunis. He's an award winning director, composer, and playwright. He's the founding director of the Halasa Theater Troupe and has directed, adapted, and comp composed music for several productions for the Egyptian independent theater, including They Say Dancing as a Sin. He is also well known to Egyptian audiences through his popular cooking show, Super Hat Trick. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca McGorn is, is our director of these performances. She's a translator, performer, theater. Can we theater. applaud the actors when they come out? <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll break protocol just for that. <laughs> um, she is a former Huntington Playwriting Fellow. Her plays and uh, translations have had readings and productions at the American Repertory Theater, the New York Theater Workshop, the Old Vic in London, and right here at the Huntington Theater Company. She is the co-editor and co-translator of the forthcoming anthology, Talk Your Tales, Plays from the Egyptian Revolution, and is currently an affiliated scholar at the Charles Warren Center at Harvard University. Next up is Melanie Stewart, the choreographer and movement director for tonight's, for tonight's pieces. Since 1984, she has been the artistic director of Melanie Stewart Dance Theater, producing over 50 original works of dance and movement for the theater for the concert stage, in dance, film, video, and in education, both nationally and abroad. Throughout her career, she has actively linked her professional work as a performer, choreographer, director, and producer to her academic career as a professor, and is now Associate Dean of Performing Arts at Rowan University. And since they were kind enough to join us, uh, we're also we call on our two performers, Miranda Craigwell, 
who is a Huntington, was a Huntington playwriting fellow and appears an actress in Smart People at, here at Huntington, where other regional credits include Lady Capulet and Romeo and Juliet and Sylvia and Two Gentlemen of Corona, Shylock and Merchant of Venice, Susan and Grace, and Aya Shanta Aya, selector and how we got on. And last but certainly not least is Ayla Peck, who returns to the Huntington as, after participating in the 2015 Summer Play Festival reading of Melinda Lopez's Yerma, her Chicago credits include The Last Stop at the Gift Theater in 1984 at Steppenwolf, The Royal Society of Antarctica at the Gift, Brahmin I, a one Hijra stand up show at About Face and Silk Road Rising, and The Lark at Premier Gift Theater on Summer. Please join us in applauding. <laughs> Tonight is going to begin with a few opening remarks from Dr. Martin. I will then pose a few questions I have for each of our panelists, and then since I know several of you are already chomping at the bit, I will open up the floor to questions from the audience. So, would you like to begin? I would. I would. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction for everyone. Congratulations to everyone. It's really a wonderful event. Um, so, I've been asked to give some global, international context to situate the, the, these two plays that we've just seen tonight. And also Rebecca Magor and Mohammed al Bakri's anthology, Tahrir Tales. Um, so let me just begin with just a kind of overview, very brief, from um, actually Rebecca's introduction to Tahrir Tales. And I'll apologize for my pronunciation in advance. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> During, so, this is Rebecca. During the 18 days of mass protest that led to the ousting of President Hosni Mubarak in 2011, millions of Egyptians demonstrated in squares, parks, courtyards, campuses, and streets throughout Egypt in what would become known as the Revolution of January 25. It came as no surprise that this extraordinary moment of mass uprising inspired theater artists to protest, perform, and set up camp for weeks at a time. For Egyptian theater artists, the events of January 2011 and the occupation of Tahrir unleashed a surge of creative energy. Their participation in the protests opened the floodgates for bold experimentation with a broad variety of theatrical forms. So that's um, the emergence of a broad variety of theatrical forms in relationship to a specific historical event and a very particular kind of urgency, which you know overall can be characterized as um, social justice um, in all its different and all its different forms. And let me briefly, very briefly, compare that to one of the opening statements of a, a book in my series from Turkey. Um, uh, let me just find that because I'm doing that in a different order than I had intended. Yes. So, Solem and Other Turkish Plays, edited by Sarah Aronson and actually published in 2011. So, uh, Aronson writes, to understand the factors that inspired these plays, so the plays in her anthology, all in the, in the same series, uh, what they meant to people of Turkey, what they say to their spectators and their imagined audiences, and to situate them in the political, economic, cultural, sociological context of the present. One needs to appreciate the trauma of September 12, 1980 when there was a coup d'etat by General Keenan Evren, Chief of the General Staff. So that is, I remember my conversation with Sarah, and I said, well, I'm planning all, everything will be post-September 11th, 2001. And she said, no, that's not our date, it won't work. <laughs> and very clearly, she writes about September 12th, 1980, in Turkey, and the change of consciousness, the events that unfolded. So the geographic and general diversity of the six playwrights in her collection reflect a wide range of issues that I think are very analogous to uh, plays from Tahrir Square, Tahrir Tale, sorry. Questions involving secularity, so being secular as opposed to religious. The headscarf issue. 
free speech, the independence of the judiciary, human rights, the disappeared, and economic inequities. Um, one more anthology I want to briefly describe, uh, entitled Apollonia, plays, new plays from Poland, and edited by Joanna Kloss. So, Joanna writes, um, Poland was a romantic and fin siècle myth that, denying modernity, persisted as long as it could not be made material. This myth persisted under the partitions throughout the 19th century until 1918, when Poland briefly regained its statehood, and after World War II, when the country's sovereignty was limited by communism and the Soviet <coughs> Union, Poland, as Polonia, was therefore a fantasy of national identity, and as such, she was not a woman but an illusion. Her relationships were all platonic, and she knew nothing of real life. Only after regaining freedom and independence in 1989, it's at the end of communism in Poland, <coughs> did she acquire a body, and with it, the bitterness of heartbreak, the burden of unfulfilled expectations, and the onus of settling historical accounts and dilemmas of identity. Above all, Poland had to uh, contend with the real problems of real people and social groups, with local conflicts and global politics, with the standards of political correctness, and with postmodern uncertainty. In short, she, Poland, had to face the permanent crisis typical of the liquid modernity in which societies of the West live. Um, so just a little bit, lastly, my last comment um, in regards to American theater. Um, so, yay for American theater. So, from the 1960s, um, which is kind of an important period, set it further back into the 50s, actors, directors, and playwrights experimented with theater as an agent of social change. And I think that's what connects all of these um, anthologies in the series in performance. Much work focused on the convergence of self-expression with a call for collective social justice. In the US, changes in approaches to actor training, playwriting, set design, proceeded along a renewed interest in theater as a political forum directly related to the period's abiding concerns, such as feminism, civil rights, and the anti-war movement. The result was that all aspects of making theater, as well as plays and productions resulting from this process, were commonly understood as implicitly linked to political intentions. And so I think the thing that underscores, that situates the two plays we saw tonight and the plays in the anthology in its entirety is a sense of a, a political urgency and um, uh, addressing unfolding realities in a form of art that places its creators and spectators in close proximity so that together they can imagine a desired future. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, I'd like to uh, direct my first couple of questions to our playwrights, since they've traveled with artists. Um, I'd like each of you to tell us a bit about what prompted you to write these pieces. Specifically, what questions and dilemmas would you say stand at the core of your work? Um, you know, what questions do you want the audience to take away from your work, wherever that audience may be? <laughs> Well, so, Penny is the co-writer of uh, Basic Dancing is the Same. Uh, you no, know, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for all of you. I want to thank everyone who is on this work. I want to thank Rebecca, thank uh, Huntington Theater and Madam Foundation, and everyone who is the reason for us being here. And forgive me if I miss some of the words. <laughs> forgive me for this. Okay. Uh, and I may uh, 
uh, ask Sarah for help. Okay. Uh, it just came up again. <laughs> uh, being surrounded with all these factors, uh, a revolution, um, people uh, asking for uh, social justice, and, and uh, being surrounded with all this corruption, uh, what, what, what? Confusion, chaos. all this confusion, yes, uh, all this mess um, on all aspects, uh, religiously, uh, politically, socially, uh, it just push you <laughs> to write something like this. We feel it all the time, but maybe we did not have the, the uh, carriage. Mm -hmm. We did not have the carriage to, to express it before revolution, maybe. Uh, although um, our play, Dancing with the Sand, uh, it was uh, originally wrote, we started working on it on 2007, mm -hmm. just as an idea, and we had many wonders mm -hmm. if we will be able to uh, perform it or not um, because of censorship, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we have many <laughs> concerns if we will be able to do this or not. But um, for some production reasons, we could not release it before 2012. And I think we were so lucky because we had the revolution on 2011. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> the luckiest. Yeah. So uh, it was that year that you can say whatever <laughs> if you think of. So uh, we released it and uh, we're here now. <laughs> See the American version <laughs> from uh, Dancing to the Set. What would you say, uh, whether, whether it was intended to be staged in 2007 or 2011 or today in 2016, um, mm. when, when you see this audience or really any audience, watching a performance of your work, what are some of the questions you want them to take away with them? Uh, um, that's a, a main thing in our work, to um, give the audience some questions to take away with them. Um, uh, that's from, uh, from my point of view. <laughs> okay. From my point of view, uh, it's one of the, the main uh, aims of theater, is to make you think. And it was just said that theater uh, is an agent of social change, right? Okay, that's it. Yeah. It's meant to be like this. Um, that's what I know about theater. Uh, so it should, it should force us to think, to think in a different way, to see things uh, from a different point of view. Um, this is a, a part of my project, a, a big part of my project in people, to make people think and uh, ask themselves. Yes, sir, what about you? Okay, it's a very long story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, but I, I wrote this play like uh, 11 years ago, uh, just after uh, being graduated. Uh, and I have that shock. Uh, 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 you think when you, you are still young that uh, when you grow up you will do so and so and so and so. And then you, you find that the society around you uh, is trying to compel you to do something that you, you don't want to do. Uh, it's in the marriage thing, uh, it's um, uh, on work. Uh, okay, this is. The, the available job, so you have to take it. Uh, don't be sure, so ambitious. Uh, don't try to think differently. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is very very common in our society in Egypt, uh, especially uh, uh, with our parents and grandparents. Maybe uh, the new generation is different from that. Uh, so I I usually. Uh, uh, see myself in writing. Um, I begin with the, the question, what if I did all the things they are telling me to do? However, that would lead me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad you said that because it actually <coughs> dovetails perfectly into my next question uh, for you. Uh, because I had, uh, when I first saw The Mirror uh, as a reading in New York almost two years ago, I had a very visceral reaction to the performance because uh, 
I felt um, there was a definite generational tension mm -hmm. at play in the piece, and you know, this is a generational tension that I've always seen, <coughs> even if I was on the other side of the world from Egypt, it was very central to a lot of issues that were going on there. Um, and at the heart of this tension is this kind of crushing certainty uh, surrounding uh, how a young person ought to behave. Um, and that any challenge to authority is somehow ill bred. And underlying that certainty, to me, what I observed uh, was a sort of pathological fixation on middle class perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, for me, it was no coincidence that you know the expression "What will people say?" which is yeah. something people say very commonly in, in Egypt, and I imagine cultures around the world, to uh, describe. Uh, uh, Behavior that is uh, what's it's to me for it seemed a leading obstacle to social change at the individual level, um, and so I, I wonder um, because you've written so many works recently, uh, we're very concentrated here. Yeah, more than more than most playwrights. So is this a theme you visited in other works? Of course. Uh, um, uh, I just need to, to speak about uh, uh, a point you mentioned right now yes, about the uh, middle class. Yes. We have a bit a bit problem uh, uh, with middle class in Egypt, uh, uh, especially in the last ten years. Okay, this is uh, uh, a class that, that is uh, between uh, uh, the very poor and uh, the, the slums that uh, have. Uh, the allowed voice yes. and the, the rich and aristocrats who have allowed voice too. Uh, 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 I think that once the middle class was leading both classes, but now it, the middle class is crushed to yeah. 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 Uh, uh, And uh, <coughs> th this make what people say, <laughs> okay, you are now between what people say and what people say. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there, there's, um, there's a lot of uncertainty and instability yes. in that world. Yes, Not sure. just globally, yes, but sure. in that one uh, slip of the mm -hmm. uh, So there, it's, it's a very protective stance of people to say things like that. You don't want to fall out of favor. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really a remarkable way of putting it. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, your, your question about the theme again. Uh, is this a theme, now, is this a theme that you visited in other works of yours? Yes. Uh, it's the, the main theme, I think, mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, people have to find their own way. Okay? I think, <laughs> although I am from the, the artists and the new generation, but I think revolutions but yeah. they're not going to be very effective. Yes, uh, 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 the revolution must be on the individual level first. Then, put everywhere. But <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't understand how how can we uh, remove a president and uh, or a system uh, while the system is in. It, Innate inside us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, going back to Hanny, um, Tina Benko, who was the actress who read the role of the dancer uh, yeah. in New York back in 2014, yeah. uh, in the post show discussion of her performance, she talked about challenging some of the ideas Western audiences might have, of, uh, might bring to the character of, of a belly dancer. And uh, she said that <coughs> this woman found her strength and independence through the art form, and that had to come through. And to this end, she said that uh, she really had to explore issues of who had the power, the dancer or the man. And there's a lot mixed up in terms of how Americans view the term dancer and what See, even how Egyptians do. Now, uh, it helps that you, as a male playwright, have written an engaging, multifaceted, conflicted, and convincing female protagonist whose authority is unimpeachable. This is something that male authors in the West are allowed to not do very well, uh, to put it mildly. So, um, 
I'd like you, for you to tell us a little bit about how you put this, how you put the character together, the character of the dancer, you and the end topic, and you know, what did you draw from, and what are some of the ideas you wanted to communicate through her? Well, uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be asked uh, this. But yeah, re yeah, it's um, <coughs> the main reason why the state dancing is the was written. Was written. Uh, the main idea of this play uh, was mine. Of course, I co uh, wrote it with Muhammad Abdel Moiz. Muhammad Abdel Moiz is the writer. I just did some editions, some uh, editing, some, uh, yeah, and uh, maybe uh, added some sentences, little things. But the main writing is from Muhammad Abdel Moiz. But the main idea was mine. It was in 2007. Uh, actually, to be frank, uh, it was something uh, in my personal life. It was something very personal. Uh, I had a crisis, uh, a really big one, really. Uh, that made me think, what can make you strong in this country? <laughs> what can make you really strong, bold, able to do whatever you want, able to um, get your rights, able to face what would make you do this? And what is the... Um, um, the, um, the, the example or the... Example, the yes. societal <coughs> example or archetype? Yes, yes. What, what, what example uh, among the society can do this? So, I don't know why. Uh, I get that. I got the answer. It's the beauty dancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's a very daring woman. She's really strong. You know what does it mean being a beauty dancer in a country like Egypt? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something easy at all. A country where most of women and girls are wearing beads. Mm -hmm. A country, yes, uh, uh, a religious country. Uh, uh, being a beauty dancer in uncovering most of your body, it's not easy at all. Facing people like those uh, uh, we heard about ah yeah in, in, the, in the tape uh, or in the play, so it's not easy at all. So uh, I don't know why I just uh, came out with that result that that example would be a baby dancer, a powerful woman who can face, who can get her rights, who can stop people whenever she wants to stop them, and she knows how to stop them. Um, she can. Who knows how to hurt when she need, when she needs to hurt, uh, and how to defend herself, and how to build that shield around her. Uh, is it fame? Is it uh, money? Is it uh, connections? Who knows? But it's the really answer. That's how the idea came up. So I started talking with Muhammad Abdel Moiz. Okay, Muhammad, uh, I think so and so and so. What do you think we should do? Uh, what a baby dancer could discuss when she's all alone by herself, <laughs> discussing it by herself, all by herself. So uh, we started to think, um, and what would make her discuss it? So uh, we came up with a result that that's her daily concerns. These are her daily concerns. Things are going all the time in her mind, all the time. She's thinking about that, how people is thinking of me, how people are trying to deceive me, how people are trying to use me, how people are judging me, how, 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 how to defend myself, how to, uh, how to um, feel like a good woman, how to be convinced I'm a good woman, although the whole society is judging me as, I'm sorry, as a slut. So, these are her daily concerns, okay? Um, and I think that was um, a powerful reason, reason why she would discuss it. Whenever she's got the um, opportunity to discuss it, she would discuss it. And we went, uh, Muhammad went writing the play, and coming back to me, reading some paragraphs, Discussing it with me, and then we came up right? <laughs> with the, with our group. That's it. 
Well, I'd like to bring our performers and uh, movement coach into the discussion as well. Um, so um, I'd like to begin with, you know, uh, either Miranda or Ayla, if you could just talk us a little, a little bit about what did you connect with in getting to these characters and uh, what did you have to learn about them in the process? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you have to connect with in these characters in order to get to them? What did you learn about them in the process? In the characters or the girl? The girl. Well, your character. Mm -hmm. your character. Um, character. I, I, I think that this girl exists in all all women. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 and maybe even men. You know, I, I don't. For me personally, I'm an actress and a dancer and an artist and I think that the way that we're perceived and the way that we're so many expectations are put on us on a constant basis, whether they're from our family, whether they're from a religion, a faith, society, media, commercials, films, everything is telling us to be certain ways and certain ways and certain ways and how can you not be confused? Um, so it was to find a connection to this girl was seamless. <laughs> it was effortless, truly, because I think she lives in all of us, and I think that's kind of a beautiful thing about this piece, <laughs> um, is that I think everybody understands. So, we had a great team. <laughs> I think um, for me, with the dancer, the thing that I, I really res that really resonated in me was this idea of luxury, and who has the luxury to, in this in her case it would be religious, but who has the luxury to decide, oh, I'm going to do this, oh, I'm not going to do that. Whether it's time or whether it's privilege, something that we talked about a little bit was the idea of white privilege and what that is and how you don't know you have it until you don't, <laughs> you know. So, and, and I thought for, for the dancer was the same thing. All these women that she's talking about, especially the ones, the, the, the rich ones, or the ones who have this, this sense of privilege, they don't know, even if they're very religious and allowed to be pious, she doesn't know, that woman doesn't know what the dancer has to go through or why she made the choice she did. But it's really easy for her to judge that. And, and that's something that I could just really resonate with as, as, an, as an actress, as a person of color. <laughs> Um, this idea of, of privilege and being able to choose. Because not everybody has that. And I think that that's a universal theme. And, some, and it's a place where I was really able to, to meet this woman. And I just, what I loved about her was just how, how fierce she could be. You know, we're going to talk a lot about that. Like she's, she could be an alley cat. She could be so street, but that's because she's seen both sides. And it's only when you see both sides that you can call each, each one out. You know, you can either be the Robin Hood and defend, you know, defend the one that's down, but you, you can't do that if you if you if you're not on both sides. And there's something about being that shapeshifter that's also quite that can be quite frustrating, you know. Because do you enjoy the trips, you know, to Cairo to the ranch in Cairo, <laughs> guiltlessly, or is your fee or what what you're paying for that experience? Is it well, you know, this guy treated me like like a whore, or this guy thought he could step on me, and that's what I pay. So I deserve this trip. I'm going to take this trip. Or I'm going to take his money, and then I'm going to give it to someone who doesn't have it. I mean, you're constantly, she's constantly deciding who she's going to be and how she's going to get into heaven, right? How she's going to, when she, her day of reckoning comes, how she's going to say, hey, look, I'm at the gate, and this is what I've done. And, I, and you know, I, I just think, as well, her, her, her relationship with God was, was very moving because she said all these people can say as much as they want, but I know him, or her. I know. I know. And the I, big difference between our characters is you are so certain. Yeah, and I, I feel like my character is <laughs> very right. Like, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things of you know, pairing these two mm -hmm. is that we have the, the ballet dancer who's so spiritual and, and, and so close to God, and then we have this girl who never mentions God and yet is having this dilemma with the veil. So that 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 contrast, and you know, just if I could, I'd like to add to what to what Miranda was saying about um, the where where women 
can, when can women really be liberated? When can they feel, find their own voice and have power? And, and for me, what the reason why I, want, I decided to translate these works is because I felt that they were asking a really important question, and that question is, when is a woman free? And both of them actually touch on similar issues. And in both of these pieces, a woman is free when she has a way to make a living, when she has independent means, when she has her own money. Um, you know, the dancer, uh, is very, she's actually a very successful dancer, so she does have her, her own money, her own living. Um, the, the character in, in the mirror who is independent and does whatever she wants and doesn't care what people say, that's the cousin Sarah who comes from a wealthy family, they have a private car, she can do whatever she wants. And so um, I, I really appreciate what Miranda was saying about privilege is that you have the privilege as a woman to express yourself, to do what you want, to choose to have an interesting career because you have that, you have that freedom that comes from a material stability. Uh, Melanie, talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, how movement factors into uh, translating these works for performance. You know, uh, Carol and I were discussing afterwards. It was a remarkably physical performance of, uh, of the mirror this time compared to uh, previous previous ones we've uh, seen. Uh, wonderful, wonderful collaboration. Wonderful, with Rebecca yeah. and Ila. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a good time. Um, so um, movement is just hugely um, useful in informing emotion and driving emotion and driving characterization. And particularly in the mirror, the, the script is six pages with a lot of opportunity and a lot of room for various physical states to be developed. You have a mirror. And there's a, certainly the cliche that you could do with the mirror, but <laughs> There's also huge possibilities with what could happen with that. And then you have all these characters. And um, the Yasmin in the room to help us, there was a lot happening in the room in terms of understanding more specifically. I think Rebecca would agree that the translation took um, another, another turn in terms of um, or another stage of development in this process through us, through movement exploration and being in the room, actually being able to work over these four days with someone as capable as Isla and willing <laughs> and to, to go to places that are really wonderful and unexplored, both for all of us in a way, um, to display and see if we could really push the edges terms of its physicality and what, what might be possible. So I don't, does that answer? I, I, I want to say something. Um, so I, uh, I, and we have a wonderful yeah. rapport about just <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I love, I love, I, it's a great um, luxury to work with Melanie. Uh, I think that in the American theater, we don't often get to have movement directors. And we have choreographers on musical theater, but a movement director, choreographer, that's something actually that, I mean, the, the Russian teachers that I studied with at the American Repertory Theater, we, that was the, th this is a culture that had movement directors. And, um, and really what's interesting about that is it's a different, it, it's because there's a different kind of theater uh, in Egypt, which um, really brings in, it's not musical theater, but it's theater with music and movement. Um, and so that the, the text, um, I mean, I would say a lot of the, the, the new plays coming out of Egypt don't, they don't do well in readings. You can't just stand and read them because there's so much going on physically, theatrically in the space. And that's actually one of the reasons that I love the um, theater, coming, <coughs> contemporary theater coming out of Egypt um, and, and from other uh, countries in the Arab world is that you, you, need, you need choreography, you need movement, you need music because that is the uh, world that these plays live in. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to direct discussion to staging Arab drama in the American context, and you know, what are what are some of the challenges uh, associated with that, and you know what what are some of the surprises as well? For me, uh, well, first of all, uh, it's not a, a, a usual thing 
to see Arab drama in translation staged in the U.S. I mean, how many of you have actually seen an Arab play in translation before tonight? If you have, what did you see? And so um, th I think the first challenge is just convincing people that there is theater in the Middle East, because when we think of the Middle East, we don't think about the theater scene there. Um, and there's good theater there, and there are great um, contemporary playwrights who are doing interesting things with form, and they're doing very interesting things with theme. And they're, doing, they're asking questions, and this is why I am so interested in this work. They're asking questions that I think we should be asking on the American stage, but we don't explore these themes enough. Uh, you know, the status of women, police brutality, uh, uh, inequality. Oh, we, we do explore them, of course, but I think that in a lot of the contemporary Egyptian work that I've been looking at in the last few years, it's really done um, in such a bold way and in such a way that is very... Um, that is very aware, again, of the material circumstances of the characters, and who has power, and who has resources. Uh, and so I look at this theater and this drama as something that I want to bring to my American audiences. That's really, that's really where my interest uh, stands. Oh, I've got one more question for our playwrights, and then I'll open up the house for questions. Um, what's, what's, what's the scene like in Cairo these days? What is, what is theater like in Egypt? I think, uh, first of all, uh, I work in the National Theatre in Egypt. Okay, <laughs> so I am kind of part of that. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, I think that uh, in the couple, of, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, uh, the theater is flourishing. Uh, maybe uh, uh, before that, uh, uh, there, there were artists that are performing to themselves, to their friends. But, but they, they weren't. How oh, oh, There wasn't a real audience for theater before the last couple of years. It was kind of mostly these small independent things in people's homes and for their friends. But I think that the situation the end of the هو للأسف بعد الثورة على طول في نوعية من المسرح طلعت كانت مباشرة أكثر من اللازم كانت بتقول الحاجات المعروفة أكثر من اللازم كانت بتحاول إن هي تقول تعيد مشاهد من اللي حصل في خلال الثورة في الفترة اللي فاتت واللي هو الناس عاشته خلاص مش محتاجينه she thinks this has changed in the past couple of years. Immediately after uh, the revolution, a type of theater emerged that was a lot more direct, a lot more um, blunt and literal, uh, trying to recreate um, scenes from the actual revolution that people had lived. Um, and you know, to her, she thinks that this wasn't very necessary because it was things that people had already gone through and had already lived through. So it was a, a lot more of like a literal, direct kind of theater. بعد كده في حاجات مضغة بدأت تطلع وبدأت تطلع حتى من الجامعات خاصة الجامعة مصحي المستقل حتى مصحي الدولة نفسه بدأ إن هو يهتم بالإن هو عايز جمهور يجي المسلاح اللي كانت فضي قبل كده after that, a more mature type of theater began to emerge, um, especially coming out of universities, mm -hmm. coming out of independent theaters, um, even coming out of the national theater, um, where they wanted to provide theater that was more subtle, more nuanced, and more mature. Uh, uh, they created an, 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 an
so first I'm hearing about this. They put in an annual membership for the National Theater for a very low price of 50 Egyptian pounds, which is less than $10, for an annual membership to encourage people to um, attend. <laughs> And this enabled them to attend as many uh, plays as they wanted throughout the year. You could attend 50 plays if you wanted for this, um, the price of this membership. Before this, there was a gap um, between ordinary people and cultural institutions, and people were afraid uh, to approach these cultural institutions or to be a part of, of theater and places that provided um, kind of cultural education. So this has now changed. Uh, people have begun going to the theater a lot more. Um, television programs and talk shows have begun to host uh, playwrights and um, you know people who work in the theater who are very successful, who have written successful plays, and so this has increased uh, the public interest in in the theater. I think I want to add. I mean, I know that Yasmin didn't didn't mean this, but um, you shouldn't get the impression that there hasn't been theater in Egypt, uh, you know, before a couple of years ago. I mean, there's a very very long tradition of theater. There, well, okay, there, were, there was theater, but there was no audience. <laughs> but, um, so, but I think, too, um, you know, there have been different stages within the, the history of Egyptian theater, and, you know, under Nasser, there was a a huge renaissance of theater yeah, and, yeah. A, a, you know, a huge uh, state support for the theaters and there was a, I mean, yeah. so, yeah. so again, yeah. there's been yeah. different stages and a lot of that has to do with the... the same that Penny was just telling me uh, and I, I told him I was just told him. <laughs> she means within her lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> why she's so <laughs> Uh, well, I'd like to open up the house to questions. Um, before I do so, uh, I realize I could stand to take my own advice here, but if you can get to the call of your question in five sentences or less, that would be great for everyone. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to continue with finding out what uh, scope there is now for theater. The way I've heard the news coming out of Egypt, it sounds like all the theater is gone. But apparently that's not accurate. So you mentioned uh, TV, and I remember there was some um, what we call situation comedy that had some Jews in it as well as Egyptians and all. So you're something there's a, a space for freedom of expression that somehow is being created. Um, she's saying it depends. 
freedom of expression de depends. In the theater, there is more freedom of expression, and she talks that up to the fact that there wasn't much of an audience before, so it wasn't seen as that great of a threat. Um, so that's why they had a little bit more wiggle room, and they had um, more space to kind of talk about issues. Um, on television, um, she was saying that, um, you know, they, talk shows will host playwrights or actors to discuss their work, uh, in the theater, but not necessarily to discuss more controversial issues, like to discuss the actual craft and um, the process of putting a book together and things like that. Um, so in terms of, of, on an actual theater level, there hasn't been very much censorship. As she said, because like the audience isn't that big, but on TV, um, censor they're a lot more careful with what is said and what is it allowed to be said. Although, I mean, the playwrights do face a, an extraordinary amount of censorship. I mean, so in, in the anthology that is coming out, there's a, actually an essay on the history of censorship on the Egyptian stage, in which um, he had Saleha, one of the, the, the great um, scholars and critics in Egypt, actually traces the censorship of in, on the stage in Egypt back to the, you know, 18th century and goes through um, until today. And so there is official censorship in Egypt. Yeah, sure, There's sure. societal censorship. There's actually a whole code of what's allowed and what's not allowed on the stage. And they're, um, you know, they're having, yeah. You, you, you find freedom. Uh, okay, uh, 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 you see, what she to do Okay. You know, agree. She's saying that, you know, there's the official rules and then yeah. there's what people actually do in practice. <laughs> <laughs> the two are not always the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't agree How with do this. Yeah. Um, we have a real censorship, a real one. So we have uh, an official censorship. People who attend the, um, what do they call it? The, uh, the uh, custom rehearsal? The dress rehearsal. The dress rehearsal. <laughs> uh, they, some employees um, representing the uh, censorship, mm -hmm. they come to attend the uh, dress rehearsal. Uh, and of course, before, before that, uh, we, give, uh, we give them our uh, scripts. Um, they read it very well. And if they have any concerns, they would call the director or the playwright and tell him uh, this and this and this and this is not admitted. You have to change it. And they call it a discussion. They call them a <laughs> discussion. But as a matter of fact, they, they call them just to let them know that this and this and this is not admitted. Yet. <laughs> and he has to change it or to remove it or whatever, whatever. But, um, and on the dress rehearsal, one of the employees come to make sure that any, everything, every remark that was said uh, in the discussion, <laughs> <laughs> in the discussion with the, with the director was both. And if not, that's a really big problem. A really big problem. Uh, that, that's what what okay. happened? And uh, after the dress uh, rehearsal, uh, after the show is open, <laughs> they, they send secret agent, agents. Well, the they, they send secret agents, you know, <laughs> among the audience. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. But I think that despite that censorship, there's also very clever and creative and, and amazing ways that the playwrights and the, and the theater artists find to, to say the bold things, the bold political statements and questions that they're asking their work, despite that censorship. Um, and that's, uh, you know, we've seen that in other, uh, we see that in other places as well. We've seen that in the, in the history of playwriting. Um, I, I don't have a, several examples. Well, in Russia, in, uh, when Moliere was writing in France, so there's ways of um, getting around censorship, yeah. and sometimes mm -hmm. it's successful, but not mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, Shukran Hanani, who is here. Shukran Baha, Hanani. Hanani, 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 um, you know, it was like almost nostalgic, although the guy is, you know, extremely liberal, as you all know. Um, so what was really interesting to me to show us back to back was that they both had these interesting structural positions. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, you know, uh, your character, the Belly Answer, 
uh, you know, she reminds me so much of a lot of hypocrisy that I see uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a Muslim myself, yeah. uh, you know, but with kind of this, um, you know, emphasis on like the uh, importance of being good on the external surface, right? A lot of people say, oh, why are you not doing the job and stuff? Yes. But, you know, that they don't, you know, they're sinning and doing worse things, mm -hmm. right? So, and, you know, there was just a lot of um, just interesting juxtapositions between these two shows. Uh, so could you speak a little bit more about the theme of hypocrisy in the, in the Muslim community? Um, <laughs> 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 So let's let's put uh, a different expression. Uh, it's a kind of contradiction, not hypocrisy. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's in my beliefs our major uh, illness. That's our major illness in the Middle East. We have loads of contradictions, loads of contradictions uh, concerning our religious beliefs, concerning our uh, social uh, uh, thoughts, and yeah, and and <coughs> contradiction, evaluating things, judging things. At, yeah, I mean, uh, that's our major illness. So I'm so glad that really those, those two uh, scripts we're discussing this issue because it's it's a clear reflection, uh, an honest reflection of what we are suffering from uh, as Middle Easterns, mentally, I mean. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, you can wear hijab and do all the evil things. <laughs> yes, and you can be unveiled or a billy dancer and do really good things and have a real, a real relationship with God. And think about, the most important thing is to think about, not to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he, to be aware he's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th that's the main issue. To be aware he's there. Uh, and that was a, a, a very uh, beautiful uh, piece of our uh, play. Uh, they say dancing in the sand, who do I harm? When she was saying, who do I harm? Okay, they, they keep saying dancing is a thing. Okay, who do I harm? What do I do wrong? Nobody's forced to come to the nightclub and watch me. They watch me with pleasure. And I never, uh, whenever I do something for myself, uh, I, I, I make sure it's not on any other uh, one expense. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't that religious? Yeah. Doesn't it sound religious? And that's a big answer. So that's what we are suffering from. It's the contradiction, judging people. And I have seen There's a famous hadith uh, by the Prophet, and kind of, you know, there's a prostitute who goes to heaven because he feeds a dog, like a homeless dog, every, yes. Yes. every day. And so that reminded me of the hadith. And another hadith about a very religious woman who locked up a cat and uh, uh, refused to feed her until the cat was dead, and she went to. <laughs> so, to hell. She went to hell. <laughs> she over, so if any of you still have questions, or might to come for the upper uh, There's the one, there's one up there. Um, one more? Yeah. Alright, we'll take one, one more, more from you, ma'am. Me? Yes. Okay. I, I apologize for this question, because I really respect your concern. But I have a lot of concerns about the figure of the belly dancer, who seems to me to be I mean, really unmoored from the realities of economic life and uh, not just in Egypt, but any place that a woman so, so outside of the social experience um, would not uh, have the kind of self-assurance um, and the judgment that she had 
Now, okay, it's a, it's a story. But I was struck by the fact that you never mentioned that you might have interviewed another belly dancer. I mean, I, uh, what I, I think I had, I had the sense of a view of society which did not have at its center a, 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 a viewer uh, so much as, I don't know, I sound very critical, and I suppose I am, but I, I mean, so, I, I'll be very honest with you. So would you, would you, would you say, would you say, and would you say the question is that the character of the belly dancer you don't think invites the viewer in in a credible enough way? Is that the question? Make a question. Make a question, my husband. <laughs> 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 is it that she's oh, unbelievable? Is that she's not believable? Just, um, I, the sense that I have is, mm -hmm. or, 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 or what connection does this judging figure mm -hmm. have to the actual life of a woman? Okay? Well, uh, I think this figure is extremely connected to all layers and categories in society. And, and we saw it. Yeah. If we, uh, uh, trace, uh, if we trace uh, um, all the tales she was telling us, we will find her uh, coming from uh, a very poor uh, category. Poor background, okay? Uh, we will find that um, her sister was married to a lawyer who may uh, belong to the middle class. Then she became an uh, ability dancer and she went to know people from other uh, social ranks. Uh, businessmen, uh, people in authority. Um, general. Uh, yeah, general. Yeah. yeah all kind of people. So, what I think that this character is rich enough, is rich enough to, to have all these experiences. Uh, and it's real. If, if you were Egyptian, <laughs> you would know what a Billy Dancer means. Uh, and not all Billy Dancers, we, we are con uh, considering a, a superstar, a diva. Which is a diva, a well-known Billy Dancer. Yes. Yes. A yes. A lot of money because yes. of her, because of what she does. So she, it's important that she's successful. Yes. Which is what Very gives her the entrance to all these places and all these social. So, you know. but, but why are we just why are we, why are we trying to prove to her that it's relevant? Or not? It is relevant. Because we're, we're, we're really being instructed to wrap things up here. <laughs> uh, so we absolutely uh, encourage anyone who has a question to, to ask us at the reception afterwards. We'll be starting immediately. Uh, we really love you.